Luke chapter 24, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15 for our message this morning, but I can't, uh, just seems like on Easter Sunday, we need to read Luke 24, 1 through 12, why don't you stand with me please, as we honor God's word. The Bible says, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to the rest." And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles and their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher and stooping down and beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Our Heavenly Father, I pray this morning... And as we look into your word, there'd be nobody wondering about what they have seen or heard, that they would truly believe this morning in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a pivotal truth in the doctrine of the Christian faith. Without it, we have nothing. I pray this morning that you'll reveal those truths and others, that if there are skeptics here, that perhaps some of their questions could be answered but I pray for what we don't understand, we'd be willing to just mix with faith and believe you, because we know that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So I pray that the hearers would have faith, that we'd have ears to hear, and eyes to see, to understand the truths that you have for us without any doubt. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. There are two pivotal occasions in the Christian calendar. December 25th, of course, we celebrate the birth of Christ, and on Easter Sunday today, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. On Christmas, we see a baby born. On Easter, we see an adult risen. Questions are asked about both occasions, the virgin birth, a sinless life, a sacrificial death, a sensational resurrection. Easter is about the resurrection. He is, he is risen. He is risen. Thank you. There are incredible things that the Bible teaches and I believe. I'm going to go over some of those very quickly with you so you'll realize where I'm coming from. I believe that God created heaven and the earth and he did it all in six literal days. I believe there was a paradise on earth called the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve lived until they sinned and God expelled them from the garden so that they'd not be able to eat of the tree of life and live forever in their sin. I believe that man grew and multiplied on the earth and the earth becoming so sinful that God regretted that he had uh, created man and caused a worldwide flood that killed every living human being except the family of Noah who the Bible records that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I believe that after the flood, men once again multiplied on the earth and turned their back on God, determining to worship the sun, moon, and stars and other constellations. And at a construction project called the Tower of Babel, God saw that in the unity of man, there wouldn't be anything that they wouldn't be able to accomplish. So he came down and changed their languages, dispersed the people's, so that they could no longer understand one another. And through that process, mankind was spread throughout the world. And that's where we get all our languages and races that we see today all started out in the story in the Bible that is called the Tower of Babel. I believe God chose Abraham as the father of the Jews to be his chosen people and to carry God's message all to all people down through the annals of time. Through God's chosen people, we have been blessed with the Word of God, the teachings of the law, most notably the Old and New Testaments, and of course the Ten Commandments. I believe God sent prophets as preachers of God's Word down through the ages to speak God's Word and warn God's people. 
about the wrath to come if they did not follow the teachings that God laid down for them in his word. I believe one of those prophets was a man named Jonah who ran from God and was swallowed by a whale. After three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, God made that fish vomit him up on the shore. Jonah, getting his heart right, went and preached in Nineveh and had a great revival in, in a place in Nineveh, which is in present-day Iraq. I believe that after hundreds of years of sending messengers and prophets, God sent his son, made of a woman, born of a virgin. I believe that that virgin-born son of God known to the world as Jesus Christ, lived a sinless, perfect life. I believe that he rose the dead, cast out demons, healed the bl made blind eyes see, and do did all kinds of incredible miracles that the Bible records that I suppose that all the books in the world could not cover all the things that he did if they were written down. He was taken by sinful, angry, lying men, falsely accused, unjustly murdered on a cross, buried in a borrowed tomb for three days and three nights, just like he said he would be. And then he rose the third day. I believe he did all this not because he was forced to or because he was captured or angry men made him do it, but I did it be, he did it because he chose to. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I believe everything written in God's word, from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, I don't question God's word. There was a time in my life when I did. I no longer do that. I understand that, that fo folks will criticize the idea of a virgin birth. It was a miraculous birth. I believe that. I understand that people can say no man could live three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. Come on, you don't really believe that. Yes, I do believe that. And I understand that people would say there's no way that a person could die and rise again. But I have chosen to believe that because I believe that it happened. I wanted to tell you all those things just to give you a background of who the whack job was talking to you this morning. In case there was any doubt in your mind where I was coming from, that is where I stand and that is what I believe. 1 Corinthians 15, we've read the resurrection account in Luke 24, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, page 1225, if you're using a pew Bible, is known as the resurrection chapter of the Bible. And I hope on every Easter you spend a little time in 1 Corinthians 15. I had a, uh, took a Bible class called Corinthians my sophomore year in college in 1982. There was a professor there, James Simons, S-Y-M-O-N-S, that if you wanted to get an A in that class, you had to memorize 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to know I got a B in that class. So I did not memorize 1 Corinthians 15. There's 58 verses in 1 Corinthians 15. And I am in the process right now of memorizing this chapter. And if I can get it memorized, I'm going to hunt James Simons down. <laughs> and I'm going to tell him it's been 33 years, pal, but I finally did it. If he's still alive and breathing, and if he's in heaven today, then, then I'll tell him when I get there. But... It's not easy, but it is a wonderful chapter talking about the resurrection and all that it starts with. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Those two verses right there, we're going to spend our time this morning, and we'll move quickly. I think it was, uh, I'll, I'll do what uh, Elizabeth Taylor said to one of her husbands, I won't keep you long, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just get this in as quickly as I can, and you can go home and ponder it, okay? But here we are this morning, and Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel. The gospel. Say that with me. The gospel. What's the gospel? Well, we were taught as young people, and it's the truth, that the gospel is the good news. This book right here is good news. Now, I know it's been maligned and made fun of, and people tell you you can't believe it or whatever, but those folks are wrong. This book is a good news book. And Paul said, I declared unto you the gospel. And so I want you to know that this book right here is nothing you need to be afraid of. Let me encourage you to have a copy of your own. 
that you can open and read and study and find its truth to be true for your very own life. It's affected civilizations and societies for thousands of years, and it's a book that you can live by. It's a book that you can die by. So Paul said, I declared unto you the good news, the gospel. And he said, which I preached unto you. Preaching is to proclaim tidings, specifically to proclaim the gospel or to deliver a sermon. Preaching can be done, though, in about anything. There are folks preaching in the legislature in Augusta. There are folks preaching in Washington, D.C. Never forget the first time I saw C-SPAN. You turn that on, and they got the cameras going, and these legislative bodies... These guys are up there. If you turn the sound off and you watch them talking, they're doing this here and they're doing this here and they're telling you how things ought to be and it looks like they're preaching to me. Well, that's what it is. They're trying to convince people that a larger government, more taxes will fix most of society. Seems like that's what they practice. Must be what they're talking about. This isn't a political message this morning, but preaching takes place in a lot of things. Preaching is taking place right now in the NCAA with March Madness, down to eight teams. You watch them talk about the teams. They got their round tables going on. And, oh, they'll, and they'll get to arguing about who's a better coach or who can play better or who's going to hit the outside shot. Same thing goes on in the NBA. Same thing in the NFL. They're all preaching their faith of what they're investing their lives in. A round ball or an oblong ball or something. Folks. There's more to life than what the score is of a game at the end of the day. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4, chapter 4, verses 2 to 4, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Preach the word. Say that with me. Preach the word. Every now and then I hear about a church, or if someone will come to our church, will preach the gospel, they'll hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, realize that they need to trust Christ as their personal Savior, Trust Christ at whatever age it is and come to me and say, you know, I'd have done that a long time ago, but no one ever said it before. I went to X church all my life or whatever it is. You know what? There are places said to say that are meeting in buildings this morning and the word of God will not be opened. The name of Christ will not be named. They'll talk about rabbits, eggs, whatever else they can throw in about Easter, but the resurrection is not their topic this morning because they found a group of people who the Bible says have itching ears that just want to be flattered a little bit, have their hand shaked, shook, shooken, whatever you do with it, feel good about who they are. They went to church once this year. God's going to appreciate that, and that's what they did. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody that is here visiting. We are thrilled that you're here. But I'll tell you what, your attendance at Cornerstone Baptist Church, God's not too impressed with. What he is impressed with is whether you've chosen his son, Jesus Christ, or not. Amen. That's a big difference. Preach the word. That's what needs to be preached, not taxes, high or low, not the government, not sports. This book right here needs to be talked about, lauded, applauded, celebrated, because it's God's word that he gave to us, and he wants us to know it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to reach those, to save some that believe. You know, this preaching thing, folks will laugh about us that we do, that we preach around here. I understand that. God himself said it's the foolishness of preaching. I'll tell you what, every now and then I will do something that not only embarrasses you, it embarrasses myself. I'm thinking, I can't watch me on, we're on camera this morning, you can go on YouTube, you can see it on the internet, you can watch it on our website, you'll see me doing all kinds of things like this and talking, and, and I look at that and I think, oh my word, I hope nobody watches that stuff. I hope nobody sees that. It's foolish. And to the world it is foolish. 
But God says, you know what I'm going to do? They think they're so smart. They think they're so full of themselves. They think they've got all the answers. I'm going to choose a way to reach them that everybody's going to laugh at, but it's going to be effective, and we call that preaching around here. And God has chosen to bless that, and it's foolish, and I understand that. Paul said, I, I share with you the gospel that I preached unto you. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have also received, accept or reject. Say that with me. Accept or reject. Pizza delivery man can come to your house, knock on the door. You open the door. Pizza. I didn't order that, but it's here. I want you to have this. It's a pizza. I'll give you a good price. I didn't order that. I don't want it. Reject. Goes down the road, knocks on the road. Oh, thanks. I thought you'd never get here. I thought it was 30 minutes or less. What's the deal? Should be free. It's been 33 minutes. But I'll take it anyway. Accept. We accept and reject things all the time. I run a small non-profit oil company. Okay? <laughs> The only, <laughs> we won't go there. But anyway, <laughs> we offer deals, things, prices. Your mother will leave you for a penny for the price of oil. My mother's here this morning, okay? <laughs> now, that's not fair to her. I, I shouldn't say that. But you know how it is. That's how it is. People will accept or reject certain things based on how they want to look at it. People have constantly accepted or rejected. Paul said, I preached the gospel which you received, which you chose to believe. Sad part is, most people don't choose to believe. If you're here this morning, you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're in the minority, not in the majority. Let's not get too full of ourselves. A lot of times people say, I want to get on the bandwagon. I want to do what everybody else is doing. Well, if that's the case, you're not trusting Christ because everybody else isn't doing that. Everybody else in 2016 is mocking the name of Christ, making fun of our standards, redefining what has been accepted for hundreds and thousands of years and saying now that everybody before them was wrong. We won't get into the details of that, but I'll tell you what. Most people reject the gospel message. But let me tell you something. And Mark touched on it in the adult class. Daniel and the three, three Hebrew children were all alone. Nobody was standing with them. And I think you ought to make up your mind, Cornerstone, this morning, that it really doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. I will stand with Jesus Christ even if I am all alone because you will never be in the majority. Paul said, I preached that idea and you folks received it. Hallelujah. They believed it. They received it. They accepted it for themselves. Why? Because honestly, I don't lie to you. I believe this book. I was raised in a Christian home, trusted Christ as a four-year-old. I've been saved now for 50 years. I like that. But I've just chosen to believe this book. There's been times in that 50 years where I've been through some valleys. I'll let you know right now, in Christ, your problems are not over. You just have someone absolutely incredible with you to help you through your problems. But I've gone through some deep water. So have you. Folks will look at this and say, I don't know, Griffin, if I can do what you're doing. I don't know if I'm interested in that. I don't think I can believe that someone was killed on a cross and came back to life. I can't believe that. Former governor, Louisiana, Edwin Edwards, I think he's still alive, was asked, this is years ago, but he illustrates very well what a lot of people think. He was asked years ago whether he believed that Jesus Christ died and rose again. His response is worth noting, and I'm going to read the quote. No, Edwards responded, I think Jesus died. But I don't believe he came back to life because that's too much against natural law. I'm not going around preaching this, but he may have swooned, passed out, or almost died. And he was taken down with superhuman strength after a period of time. He may have revived himself and come back to life, unquote. Well, you know what? That's not how it went. 
But on the other hand, you can see how folks would think that. Now, it goes absolutely contrary to the facts of the crucifixion. That's not how it was. You, you, that's quite a recovery when a Roman spear can pierce your side and go right up through your lung and your heart. And you yank that thing out and you have a good little nap in a cool tomb will revive you. I think we need to go ahead and get some caves somewhere and put some sick people in them and see how they do. Obviously, that's the miracle cure. But we know that's not the case. But I want you to see that the resurrection is pivotal in 1 Corinthians 15. Look with me very quickly in verses 12 through 15. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I want you to know we preach Christ crucified and risen. But even back in Paul's day, in today's day and age, there are some among us that say there was no resurrection. But that creates a real problem. But if there be no resurrection, in verse 13, but if there be no resurrection from the dead, then is Christ not risen? If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of Christ because we testified of God that he, he no, and we are found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be the dead rise not. Here's the problem if Christ didn't rise. Stan Griffin is a liar. You are Lost in your sins, there is no forgiveness. Everyone that we say is asleep in Jesus. I want you to know the Bible teaches, does not teach soul sleep. But when it refers to a believer dying, they don't die. They've gone to sleep or they've gone into their rest. It's a restful thing to die in Christ. Why? Because to die apart from Christ is not restful. It's horrible. There is no rest. But I'll tell you what, to be in the presence of God Almighty when you leave here, oh boy, there's some rest there. The grief is over. The struggle is over. There was a movie I watched one time. There was this guy, detective, and he was working hard, and he's all stressed out and everything. And the guy says, man, you need to go home and get some sleep. And he says, no, I'll sleep when I die. And I thought, that was kind of funny. But you know what? You and I will get some rest when we pass out of this world, go on to be with the Lord. But I'll tell you what, if there is no resurrection, all of that is a lie. It's not true. Paul says we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There's nothing else. There is nothing else. There is nothing else. I can't overemphasize, folks, if there is no resurrection, Stan Griffin's life is a total failure, a total lie, a total mockery. Every dollar you ever gave to the cause of Christ, every trip you ever made to the Cornerstone Baptist Church, every witness that you ever said to a lost person, every prayer that you ever prayed that something wonderful would happen if God would just intervene, forget it, it doesn't exist. I'm telling you, folks, it's a critical component. He rose again. Say it with me. He rose again. It makes a big difference. I always refer to it on Easter a few years back. They, they said they found the grave of Jesus. Well, there was definitely some graves marked Jesus, I'm sure. It was a common name. They didn't find Christ's grave. And so the reporter, in his ignorance, asks a question of someone well, really, so they find his grave. Is it any big deal? <laughs> yeah, that's a big deal. But that's not going to happen. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which you also received and wherein you stand, but which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. I declared it, you received it. You can stand on it. By which you stand, he said. I want you to know this life can do some things. If we just stopped, and we don't have time this morning, we won't. We don't want to put anybody on the spot. We just stopped in this section. And then we went to this section. And then we went to this section. And then we went to this section. And then we went up into the balcony. And we just took a minute to talk about some of the heartache that's been experienced in this room right here. Oh my, you, you have no idea. Uh, men's Bible study a week ago, two weeks ago, I'm not exactly sure, we talked about one of the things that gives you the ability to minister to others 
is going through some pain yourself. One thing this church is blessed with, and I did not misuse the term, one thing this church is blessed with is a room full of hurting people because God has used you in your pain. I wrote in the newsletter at the beginning of this year, one thing I learned last year is that the trouble you've experienced in your life today, the valley that you go through, will help you guide someone else through that same, same valley in the future that does not know the way. You can stand on God's word. You can count on it getting you through. You can believe that God is alive because he is, and he'll not forsake you. He'll never leave you alone. I declare to unto you, you received it, you can stand on it. And lastly, he said, by which also you're saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. You know, you, choices matter. Say that with me. Choices matter. You've chosen this morning to be here for an hour at the Cornerstone Baptist Church. We're coming to a close. Hopefully I'll get you out on time. I know you got ham to eat, okay? <laughs> but I'm also told that today was maple syrup Sunday. I didn't know that until I got to church here this morning. I'll tell you what, I, I wake up early on Easter. I just love the whole thing. You, you can't beat what the resurrection means to a gospel preacher. From four years old, I, I, someone said, when were you called to preach? I have no idea. I've always wanted to get a bunch of people together and just tell them about the gospel. That's what I always wanted to do. I just wanted to do that. Nobody will be back next Sunday. I'm telling you, just the whole thing just excites me, okay? My wife is embarrassed. All right. <laughs> but you know, not everybody thought about coming to church today. Some folks decided they'd go and watch moisture drool out of a tree. <laughs> Isn't that what sap is? They all look at oh, how cool is that? They drill a hole and the real water runs out of it. And we'll catch some of that and we'll go boil that. They, you know, they say the Indians started this process. And then we'll just take some of that and then we'll, we can make things out of it. And it's going to be so great. So let me tell you, when your family's sick, you're going to pray to that piece of fudge that you made from maple syrup. Or how about just get a jar of that and set it on the mantle. And, oh, maple syrup. Will you please help us in our time of trouble? So you stand, that's ridiculous. No choices matter. And I've chosen to center my life around a book and a message that will allow people, if they will believe it, to live forever. How long is that syrup? You know, syrup after a while goes bad if you open it up, leave it in the cupboard. It gets nasty. This message is as pure as it's ever been. It doesn't go bad. Gospel which I preached unto you, which you also received, and wherein you stand by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Some people will say, oh, yeah, I believe that, and then they go off, and their life's not changed, and they just said the words, but it didn't change them. But some people, if they've not believed it in vain, there was a time in their life where they said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died. Paul said, I preached unto thee of the gospel. What was the gospel, Paul? Well, he records it in verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how it was told to me, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, according to God's word, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus lived and died. You've got to believe that he was God come in the flesh. You need to believe that when he died, he laid in the grave for three days and three nights, but the Bible says he rose again. You need to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You need to believe that. Now, if you do believe that, turn to that one sitting next to you and say, I believe that. George, you don't believe it? You didn't turn to James. <laughs> James, you don't believe it? You didn't turn to George. Now, you guys look at each other right now. All right. Now, those guys who are on the platform here playing the instruments, and they're lost. 
Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Everybody is going to turn to their neighbor at some point and say, I believe that. Problem is, if you believe it on the other side of this life, after you've already passed through the grave, I heard this week that someone said, a hole in the sod is just a doorway to eternity. Speaking of a grave. And I thought, I don't really care for that because I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the upper taker. If that's a doorway, if that's a doorway to eternity, it's only a doorway down. And I'm going up. But you can see what I'm saying. The time's gonna come if you believe in God after you've gone through the doorway, it's too late. But if you believe this morning. That gospel that Paul said he delivered unto you. Jesus died and rose again. The Bible says in, in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you'll confess with your mouth, you know what, if you believe it, you better be willing to turn to your neighbor and say so. Because if you don't, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you've got to say so. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which God did. You can be saved for the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is my wife down here, the short-haired blonde. Well, she's a blonde right now. We'll see how, okay? <laughs> yes. There was a time in my life when I told her I loved her. I try to tell her that every Easter for sure, okay? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if we didn't communicate that love to one another by saying so, that relationship would break down. If you're not willing to communicate your love to God Almighty by saying you believe, there is no relationship. At some point, you need to say so. I need to say so. Say that with me. I need to say so. And if you haven't, then you are lost. But it doesn't have to stay that way. This morning, you can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be my Savior. I believe that you died and rose again, and I want you to come in and live in me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. This is the time of decision. This is the most important part of the service. This is when a lot of times distractions happen and babies start crying or things wondering. You say, what's going on? Please be quiet. Please remain in your seat. Don't go anywhere. Just think about the opportunity that is yours right now. Have you trusted Christ and have you said so? Or have you not trusted Christ but this morning you realize, you know what? I believe that. And if you're in that second group which says, you know what, I believe that, but I've never told anyone, I've never prayed and received Christ as my Savior, then right now this is your chance. Don't miss it. Don't wait any longer. And we as a, as a church family, we're all going to pray that prayer that I just said. We're going to pray that prayer out loud. We're going to pray it quietly. But if you're willing to pray that prayer with us and believe in your heart that God sent his son, that he died, that he rose again, that he did it for you, and you're willing to trust him as your savior and tell the Lord that you believe, then right now you can become a Christian. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my savior. Forgive my sins. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose for me. I want you as my Savior. Please come into my heart. Our Heavenly Father, you saw the hands this morning. In a room this size with this number of people, there's no question that there are folks that needed you just by the the numbers by the percentages God I pray that those folks that raise their hand will never forget Easter Sunday 2016 where they told you that they believed in you and I pray they've not done it in vain but they mean business and will never go back on that and I also pray that they would tell whoever they came with so that it wouldn't be a secret they need to let folks know that they are a believer 
Or they could get out of their seat during the invitation and come down, shake my hand, and say, Stan, I prayed that prayer. I wanted you to know. What a great moment that would be, a turning point in their life, one they will never forget for all eternity. And we are not even capable of understanding that truth. So, Lord, now we turn our hearts and thoughts to Christians, folks that have already prayed that prayer. And maybe we have denied you. Maybe we've been embarrassed about you. Maybe we've been ashamed of the gospel. We've forgotten how important it is. God, reignite in us a heart for the things of you. Help us to always choose that this is where we want to be, close to you, adoring you, living for you. Lord, if there are loved ones in our family that are on, our, on the road to a Christless eternity, I pray you'd give us a burden for them that we could reach out to them and share the gospel with them. Lord, as we open up the altars, I pray there'd be no person here that needs to do business with you that doesn't take advantage of this opportunity. Bless this time, please. Thank you for moving in our midst this morning. Thank you for rising for my justification and my forgiveness. Bless this time, please, in Jesus' name.